Tatsavitur Virenyam Bargo Devasya Dimahi Dio Yona Prachodayat Om Shanti 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 that feel? <laughs> We're going to get things on the road here. I'd like to welcome John Mankins to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to follow that. <laughs> um, I, will, I will say the, uh, the last time I heard a uh, quotation uh, from uh, a poem in Sanskrit was at a meeting in Dubai back in February uh, where the uh, president of France, not Macron, uh, but the, the, the head of state was speaking. Uh, and so was uh, Prime Minister Modi from India. Modi. Modi, Modi, pardon, my, pardon me. And Modi from India. And uh, during the course of the, 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 two, the two talks from the two men, uh, the president of France uh, was very gracious to speak in English and um, quoted uh, from um, uh, Roman literature, and uh, what else? The other one he did, and he was also he quoted Shakespeare, he quoted Roman literature. Anyway, it was extremely erudite. And then, of course, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, quoted poetry in Sanskrit. And I was thinking, you know, just uh, such such marvelously erudite and thoughtful uh, world leaders. Uh, <laughs> it was quite, quite astonishing. Um, I'm not sure whether or not we will rise to that level of erudition during the next four days. However, I have to say that I think that um, the organizers of the, this conference, a uh, team of a uh, couple of dozen of really fine uh, leaders from across the space sector and across the National Space Society, have assembled a really marvelous program for you. Uh, we have four major themes, including space settlement, uh, space business, uh, space uh, infrastructure and transportation, space exploration and, and innovation. Uh, over um, several sessions, uh, starting today, uh, and uh, including um, a wide diversity of luminaries, not only in the sessions, but of course uh, at the meals, uh, a, a, a high, personal highlight for me is going to be seeing Freeman Dyson speak on Saturday evening. Uh, he's truly one of the great geniuses of the 20th century and the 21st. Um, he's speaking about the future of humanity in our galaxy. Uh, and uh, uh, not to mention uh, the talk we're going to hear in a few moments uh, from uh, Tom Muller, uh, one of the great engineers of the 20th and the 21st centuries. Um, so I think that uh, you can look forward to a, a really outstanding program this year. I think probably the biggest challenge for you is going to be deciding where to spend your time. Um, I will make one special request and that's just to urge you all to try to sit in on as many of the student lectures as you can. Uh, the kids uh, who are here this year, uh, both uh, high school and, and some uh, uh, 
uh, graduate and undergraduate uh, have all done uh, wonderful work uh, in preparing their materials to, uh, to bring to you. Uh, and I think uh, um, listening and, and uh, really trying to uh, look at it constructively and, and uh, think about which of these kids you'd like to be hiring if you have the opportunity to be hiring uh, is, uh, is worthwhile. With that, I'd like to introduce the Chief Executive Officer of the uh, National Space Society and the Chairman of the Executive Committee, uh, Mark Hopkins. Uh, Mark Hopkins uh, is not only a longtime space advocate, very long time, but he was one of the, uh, the instigators of the merger uh, more than 30, 35 years ago of the uh, National Space Institute and the L5 Society to form the National Space Society, uh, which uh, um, over the last 35 years has become uh, the premier organization worldwide promoting the future settlement of space by humanity. Uh, Mark uh, had a number of other things in his official bio. Uh, the one that I will highlight is, is a, a little tidbit that I recall, and that is that Mark had the uh, opportunity to, um, as I recall, go to school or grad school with uh, Janet Mullen, the uh, most recent uh, uh, head of the uh, Federal Reserve, just passed. Janet Yellen. Yellen, Yellen, Janet Yellen. Uh, so that very <laughs> during her tenure, very unusual uh, to be able to sit down with Mark and have him tell stories about her uh, <laughs> back in the day. Of course, I, I uh, uh, in in uh, in finishing this introduction, I will just say, but on the other hand, I had the opportunity to go to college with Scott Pace. Uh, and so also a rather distinguished uh, leader in space these days. So with that, may I please turn the uh, podium over to Mark Hopkins. And uh, Scott Pace used to work for me. Anyway. Um, I'm going to talk about why is the ultimate goal of the National Space Society important? Assuming this works. Okay. Our ultimate goal is space settlement and the use of the vast resources of space for the dramatic betterment of humanity. And this has been our ultimate goal really since the beginning of the organization 40 years ago. And the fundamental problem that the human race faces is that we're poor. This is how bottom quarter of the humanity currently lives in places like this. Humans, the average, uh, the a majority of humans live at a per capita income, which is a factor of 25 below what the average in the United States. The poverty line in the United States, which is the definition of, if you're under the part of the po uh, poverty line, then you're poor as far as the United States is concerned. That's a factor of three below the average in the United States. Most humans are at a factor of 25, much, much poorer than the so-called poor in the United States. And that's not the poorest people in humanity. The bottom quarter lives at a capital income, which is a factor of 100 less than it is in the United States. So, fundamental problem. We need to, over time, erase this poverty, plus deal with the fact that the world population is increasing. And of course, in countries like the United States, we want to increase our per capita income further. So, where are we going to get the needed resources? Furthermore, Americans are pessimistic about the future. This is a new development. We've had this thing called the American dream since early colonial times, uh, which everybody, the uh, vast majority of the population believe that each generation will be better off. Their kids will be better off than they are, and their grandkids will be even better off than that, and this was always true. And why is this? It's because lots of pundits have gone around and said, look, Earth's resources are finite, which is obviously true, and we're beginning to hit those limits. And 
particularly when one takes in consideration reasonable environmental constraints, people are going to be worse off in the future. The future of the human race is dismal. And compared to the United States, Europeans are far more pessimistic than we are in the United States. So this is not good. But the truth of the matter is that resources are not limited. And that's because the vast majority of the resources of the solar system lie in space and not on the Earth. One way to grasp the size of the material resources is to ask the question, how much land area could be produced if we used these resources to build O'Neill settlements? What's an O'Neill settlement? Most of you already know this, but not everybody. O'Neill settlement is like a cylinder. It's several miles long and a few miles wide, and you spin it so you have artificial gravity on the inside at Earth normal. You can walk around. You bring in sunlight through an arrangement of mirrors and windows. You fill the thing with Earth normal air, and you contour the inside. So it's a really nice place to live with soil and, as you can see here, little streams and, and uh, meadows and, and things. You're basically building land area. Here's another picture. Really nice place to live. It's designed to be as nice as the nicest places on Earth. Now, Jeff Bezos, who's going to be our speaker on Friday night and is now the richest man in the world, uh, has suggested that we use O'Neill Space Settlements to house millions of people in space in the long run. Well, how many, how big can we, in terms of land area, can we make if we build a lot of these and sort of add up the land area across a lot of these cylinders. If we use the asteroids, which are roughly the right composition, and only the asteroids, we can increase the land surface area by a factor of a thousand. Now think about that for a minute. When the New World was discovered, and loosely speaking, it added about 50% to the land area of the Old World. That's 1.5 factor. Here we're talking about a factor of a thousand. And it doesn't stop there, because there's a lot of asteroids and cometary material which are not in the asteroid belt. And if you take those into consideration, we get in the solar system another thousand factors. You add those two thousands up, we're talking about a total of a million times the land surface area of the Earth. And that's materials. In energy, the situation is much better. The sun currently produces 10 trillion with a T, times the amount of energy currently used by the human race. And newsflash, the Air Force has just initiated a two-year, begin in the fall, $283 million program aimed at bringing some of this energy down to the Earth. So this thing is real. So what's the solution to our problem? Use the vast resources of the solar system to smash the resource constraints of Earth. Americans don't like constraints. We're very much into smashing them. So let's do that. And restore the American dream, this time not just for Americans, but for all of humanity. And create a future which is dramatic, with a dramatically higher standard of living than in America, and to this time around, not just for Americans, but for the entire human race. National Space Society is not just about space. We're about creating a prosperous, hopeful future for all of humanity. Thank you. And now I have the honor of introducing uh, Avin Nash, who is, uh, Shirodi, who is president of our Nashik chapter, which is our chapter in the city of Nashik in India. And he has come here uh, entirely at his own expense, uh, which is, you know, people in India are not exactly as rich as people in the United States, so this is a big deal. He's a former ISRO engineer, ISRO being the Indian equivalent of NASA, and he has a really diverse engineering background, not only in astronautics, but he's done significant work in, art, in engineering type work in architecture, software, electrical, mechanical, agricultural, automotive, and pharmaceutical. And he's going to explain what a felicitation ceremony is. We're an international organization, so we <laughs> Thank you.
नमस्ते दिस इज आवर इंडियन ट्रेडिशन टू से हेलो बाय से नमस्ते इट मीन्स आई बो टू द डिवाइन इन ईच वन ऑफ यू आई हैव ब्रॉट ग्रीटिंग्स फ्रॉम वन पॉइंट थर्टी फोर बिलियन पीपल ऑफ इंडिया वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन वॉट अ वंडरफुल डे इट इज आई एम अविनाश शिरोडे प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ एन एस एस नाशिक इंडिया चैप्टर अवर चैप्टर वॉज फॉर्म इन फेब्रुवरी टू थाउजंड सिक्सटीन जस्ट टू इयर्स एगो एंड इट वॉज इनॉग्रेटेड बाय डॉक्टर अनिल काकोडकर एन एमिनंट न्यूक्लियर साइंटिस्ट ऑफ इंडिया आई एम अटेंडिंग आई एच डी सी फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम एज पर इंडियन कल्चर गेस्ट इज गॉड अतिथि देवो भव Traditionally, we felicitate the guests at almost every program, every ceremony, as an expression of good wishes, respect, and love. On February 12 this year, I had sent a request of my desire to felicitate ISDC and NSS dignitaries during ISDC first day plenary session. I am so happy to share with you all that my proposal of felicitation. was very positively discussed amongst the concerned people and i am thankful to the trio john mankins park hopkins and bruce speetman for their kind permission and great effort of carving time from a very tight schedule for this program i would also like to specially mention the efforts of mr eric bowen who is the president of uh, houston chapter of nss then uh, anita gail marian addison aggie cobrin dev dressler annie watkins lynn zelinski net sesherba lawrence aham and others for discussing supporting and taking forward my proposal thank you all now coming to felicitation the shawl this is the shawl is a decorative piece of cloth to be wrapped around the shoulders signifying divine principle of the person the garland is of sandalwood petals and recognizes the superior knowledge and intellect of a person and a very special headgear called puneri pagdi which is a symbol of intelligence knowledge respect honor and devotion to the work this pagdi comes from the city of pune which is a cultural capital of our state of maharashtra it has tradition of more than 200 years and interestingly the geographical indication status was granted to this headgear under intellectual property rights on 4th september 2009 i am also presenting a memento of our chapter specially made for this occasion this is a uh, which uh, indicates this is the our work horse polar satellite launch vehicle pslv on both the sides then uh, nss uh, logo and to give the geographical location of our chapter because people would know india so in india the state of maharashtra then a state of maharashtra in which my city of nashik and this is the nashik city in which my office is there so it's a geographical location also has been made clear in this i have also brought a traditional lamp uh, for the nss head office which denotes tamasoba jyotirgamaya that means from darkness to light from knowledge to wisdom may this divine light illumine our intellect when the felicitation proceeds as per our tradition and culture we first seek the blessings of lord ganesha and then the sanskrit mantras 
are chanted to seek the blessings of God Almighty for the world peace, brotherhood, and smooth and successful proceedings of the function and the four days of our ISDC conference. These mantras were specially recorded by 11 uh, learned people in a chorus. Thanks to all, and now let me proceed for the felicitation. Yeah. Uh, of the dais, I would like to felicitate Buzz Aldrin as a second human being to land on the moon from my chapter. I'd like to, uh, I'm deeply honored by this, and I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Avinash and, and all of India for, for, for doing this. Um, put on my economics hat for a moment. I'm aware of the fact that there's this thing in economics called the convergence theory, where the per capita income of all nations are converging. And that means that the nations with the largest economy uh, by the end of this century is very likely going to be India, which has a profound implication for our future in space. And it's uh, something which uh, I very much hope that the National Space Society will play a significant role in India uh, as we continue to push for what's good for humanity as a whole.
This is my new look. So I see Jim Crisofoli back there. I thought going to Hawaii was really cool when you got to wear lays, but Jim, you're going to have to you know, up, your, uh, up your game now to, uh, to keep up with the Indians. Um, my name is Bruce Pittman. I'm the Senior Vice President and Senior Operating Officer of the, uh, of the National Space Society, and it is certainly an honor to welcome you all here today. Um, it's good to be back in, in LA. Um, it's always been a, a, good, uh, a good home for our conference. Um, one of the really great parts of, of being an officer in the, in the NSS, not that all parts of being an officer in the NSS aren't great, but one of the better parts of being a, an officer in the NSS is you get to give out some really cool awards to some really amazing people. Um, and I just wanted to put, uh, to take a minute um, to talk about both the Space Pioneer Award and then to put this in a little bit of context. So the Space Pioneer Award is a, a, an award we give out in a number of categories um, to honor people that have really made a contribution to carrying out that vision that Mark just laid out about, um, you know, expanding humanity out into the solar system and using the resources of, of the solar system to greatly enhance the quality of life here on Earth. And we've done this for a number of years. We have a team of people that work very hard uh, putting, these, uh, putting these award ceremonies together and, and doing that. And so John Strickland leads the team that does that and, and, and they do a, a really great job. And, and the reason that this is important, I think, is to honor people that are really making a difference. And so I wanted to give a little bit of historical context for this. So I want to take you back to 1962. And you say, well, what happened in 1962? Um, Thomas Kuhn, who was a scientific historian, wrote a book that he published that year called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And what um, Kuhn was basically asking was, why was the history of science so choppy? You know, why was it so discontinuous? And, you know, the, the old joke was that um, progress in science, is, science um, happened one funeral at a time. And, and so he wanted to know why. So one of the things he did in his book is he came up with this idea of paradigms. A paradigm is basically a set of rules. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And he also came up with the concept of paradigm shift, of when one set of rules transitions to another set of rules. So a number of people built on that work in the years, and one of them you know, where uh, Kuhn was basically focused on science and the history of science, some other people tried to apply this in other areas. One of them was a guy named Joel Barker, who years later came up and tried to apply this to business. So when I was a graduate student, I was reading his stuff and, and trying to, to articulate it. And he had what I thought was a really great definition of a paradigm and a paradigm shift. He said, a paradigm is a problem-solving system um, similar to something, an example of that would be the scientific method is a problem-solving system that, that's good for, you know, solving problems. Um, but in any paradigm, what happens over a period of time that they begin to break down and they become, uh, become more and more problems that that existing paradigm can't solve. And as that number of problems that, that go unsolved gets larger, there becomes more and more um, fertile ground for um, new people to come in with new paradigms, new sets of rules to try to, um, to, to answer those questions that the old paradigm.